everyone for coming out. Um, my name is John Padfield. I'm a professor at Purdue University and I have a training and consulting business that I run on the side. Uh, I'm Dave Moss. I am an investigative researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco. I usually introduce myself by saying I'm a member of the smallest minority in the United States. I have a PhD in technology leadership and innovation from Purdue University, and I serve two terms in the Indiana House of Representatives. So an elected official that knows something about technology makes me a tiny, tiny minority. <laughs> I'm gonna be uh, moderating tonight, and uh, I, I've got a few things I'd like to cover. There was a very interesting uh, Indiana appellate court ruling handed down just last week. August 24th. It's a, a very exciting one and for anyone that uh, values privacy it's a, a great ruling. Um, also uh, Dave has some slides that he's put together so I'm going to let him start off first just talking about the mechanics behind biometric identification and then we'll come back and we'll talk about some of the legal sides. I just want to remind everyone of the sign over here in the corner that says panelists provide information, opinion, and discussion only. We're not giving legal advice. We are going to talk about uh, some core issues that have come up in the past and uh, some precedents that have been set, but uh, this is not legal advice. Yeah, and I'll add, yeah, I am not a lawyer either, and it is 8.30 on Saturday, so if you ask me for numbers or statistics, I'm going to say a lot, or I will say thousands, or I will say millions, but beyond that, uh, my brain has ceased to be able to hold, <laughs> hold specific numbers in my head, so I, forgive me. So when we talk about biometrics, we're talking about physical characteristics and behaviors that are unique to you. So this might be your fingerprints, this might be your irises, this might be your face, this might be your tattoos or scars or birthmarks, it might be how you walk, it might be how you sign your, your name. Anything that you do or have on you that uh, could be captured, digitalized, uh, digitized into you know, numbers and then matched against you later. Uh, we've put together a, a pretty good guide uh, at EFF's uh, Street Level Surveillance Project explaining how biometrics work. We're primarily uh, interested, at least in terms of this project, uh, in uh, mobile biometrics. So these are devices that law enforcement carry on them. Uh, sometimes they're separate devices, sometimes they're as simple as a, an app they've installed on their phone, um, which they might use in the field uh, during a stop or during arrest to either capture biometric information for you or to use biometric information to identify you. Um, so this sort of graphic is pretty simple. Your cop may swab your, your cheek. They may take a picture of your face. Uh, in San Diego, for example, they have a pretty significant uh, project going where you know several dozen agencies have Android phones that they use to uh, take a photo of your face and match it against their mugshot database. Uh, but fingerprinting is probably the most common one um, where it is a device that often looks like oh, this that you would put your finger in the bottom and then it would pop up information. It may pop up your mug shot, depends on what kind of database it's hooked up to. Once they capture that information, uh, they have an algorithm that starts looking for markers and starts you know, basically creating metadata for it, whether that's points on your face or points on your, you know, the, the, the structure of your fingerprint. Uh, a lot of times private companies are the ones who've developed this, so their algorithms are very proprietary, so uh, you know, we're not really able to look at them or analyze them very closely, which in a police context or in a court context can be uh, quite difficult, especially if a piece of technology has been used to identify you and there's not a good way to verify that the technology is actually good enough to identify you. Um, once it does that, uh, that digitization, uh, all of these things will plug in, feed into some sort of database, um, and there'll be profiles in this database. And then, uh, you know, when they get an image, they feed that image in, the system looks for those points, matches it to those points, produces maybe a list of people who have similar characteristics with a 90%, 80%, 30%, 15%, and it might just go down the list. Um, to just give you an idea of what this actually looks like practically, here's uh, the instruction manual for what seems to be a fairly older but probably still in use uh, BlackBerry based system. Um, and you can see how there's like a spot for you to, you know, where they want you to put the person's finger and it tells you where it is. And then once they have that, they'll tell you whether they had a hit. And then they'd bring up your mugshot. Hopefully, you don't look like this person. <laughs> um, 
but you know that's how it works with facial recognition this is an example of the uh, san diego system um where you know they can take a picture of you and again in this case it just brought her up which i guess she's the program director for the technology department um but it's kind of as simple as that um you know these this technology, you know, early on, it just had to be a straightforward mugshot. As it's getting more and more sophisticated, they're pulling images like partial facial images off video. Um, one of the funnier scientific research programs I saw was using, I believe it was the British TV, TV series Holyoaks or like Coronation Street or something. BBC handed over like hours and hours and hours of this soap opera to uh, the U.S. government to start practicing how they can get facial recognition by using famous people on this show. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop there for a second. I do want to talk about uh, one of the major projects I've, I've worked on in the last year is tattoo recognition, which has some very specific and unique uh, capabilities. But if we want to take a break and move on to something else for a second, I can come back to that in a moment. Sure. I just want to touch on uh, two quick points. One of the things in the classes that I teach, I constantly tell my students, technology is neutral. There is no such thing as a good technology or a bad technology. It's what do you do with it? However, with that said, some technology is much more powerful than others. The biometric identification is one of those. I don't think we, anyone fully grasped just how powerful this technology is and what can be done with it and how it could be misused. With that said, um, like I said, there, there's legitimate purposes for this. I want to just throw out one scenario and I can only speak about Indiana. I suspect this is true across most, if not all states, but in Indiana, there's a wide disparity from county to county with what type of technology law enforcement has available. Some counties are state of the art, some almost remind you of Mayberry. But uh, and, and often that's because someone in there is very good at writing grants or absolutely. or there's a company that's very aggressive about marketing a technology and will give them, you know, a, you know, half a million dollars worth of technology to borrow for six months. And so that kind of gets them hooked on it. So imagine this scenario. My guess is looking at this room, probably 60, 70 percent of you have your fingerprints in a database somewhere the government has access to. If you, well, I, I know the miner in there multiple times. Not only do I have a concealed carry permit from multiple states, I have a class three permit. Uh, that took a lot more scrutiny. Uh, I do consulting work for law enforcement. Another set of fingerprints were submitted to uh, get my credentials for that. So my fingerprints are in there, probably the majority of you, your fingerprints are in there for one reason or another. If you work for government in Indiana, your fingerprints are on record. If you work with kids, if you're a nurse, things Work like with that. kids, nurse, um, daycare, anything like that, your fingerprints are on, on file somewhere. If a person whose fingerprints have never been taken gets pulled over um, for something serious enough they're gonna go to jail for, could be a DUI, could be um, controlled substances found in their car, if a person goes to jail for the very first time, their fingerprints are not on record. When you go in to get processed, your fingerprints will be collected. But who are you? You could lie about your name and your false name is going to be attached to that set of fingerprints in the record forever. Again, not legal advice. I, not, not legal <laughs> advice. <laughs> but uh, your fingerprints, your biometrics will be attached to that false name that you give. Now, if I was a horrible person, I could go out and spend some time on Facebook until I find somebody that generally resembles me, about the same height, about the same age, about the same weight. I could find somebody that generally resembles me. And when I get arrested, I could give that person's name. And if I was really evil, I could find out their social security number, their address. I could give all types of false information to law enforcement. And now, even if I spend a year in jail, I'm released, I still have a clean record because there's no record of me being in jail. My fingerprints are now associated to somebody else. This is a different form of identity theft. That poor person, if I go out and commit another crime and there's a warrant issued for me, they're gonna be looking for somebody else. And so the, the whole idea of having mobile biometrics so that police can positively identify someone, there is a legitimate need for that. With that said, there is some uh, potential for abuse with certain types of biometrics. So I just want to bring out that there is balance to this. 
it's a technology that we need to be very cautious of, very watchful over, but uh, there is a legitimate need for being able to positively identify a person. Awesome. So I want to, oh, quick question. Oh, we, we do have a microphone in back. If you have a question, we would love to have your questions. Uh, but if you have one, just raise your hand and they can pass the microphone to you. Quite a question. So you just got out of jail with a fake identity and a driver's license and a, and a, and a fingerprints. So the next time you commit a crime and they're going to go, hey, let's go get this guy, John Wilkes Booth over there. And they go arrest him and he gives his fingerprints and stuff. Don't they have to let him go because wrong phone fin fingerprints biometrics with him? Yes. Now, what's going to happen is it's going to mess with him. May take It'll days. totally screw his life yeah. up for a while. If, 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 he, if there is a warrant out for me, but I gave his name, and he gets pulled over for speeding, he's probably going to jail because there's an open warrant out for him. And the social security number matches. When he gets to jail and they print him, they realize, oh, these prints don't match the person we're looking for. And the actual faces are going to get closer and closer. Yes. Okay. But you're still at large. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and if I get picked up again and I give a different false name, there are some individuals that have 30 to 40 aliases in the database. One set of fingerprints, but that set of fingerprints may map to 30 or 40 different names, a dozen social security numbers, and a dozen fake addresses. Cool. Uh, yes. oh, do you, you have a follow-on on that? I, I, I had a question about... Oh, you, use the microphone. Yeah. I had a question about the fingerprints. So I've heard that fingerprints, um, they are not a, an exact thing, that you have, that you have a like a 5, 10, x, x number of point match. And depending on uh, how good the fingerprint is, it cannot necessarily be the same thing all the time, if that makes, if that, is that correct or not? As Dave was explaining, <coughs> if, if I am fingerprinted, there are going to be 10 really good prints of my fingers. If a fingerprint is recovered off of something that I've touched, there may only be a partial print. Now, the, the partial print can be compared against a database of existing fingerprints. And depending on how much of a fingerprint is on the item that they recovered a print from, they may not be able to 100% say, this fingerprint from this cup goes to this person. They may be able to narrow it down to 10 people because it's a partial print. Oh, sweet. Uh, I'll jump out of tattoos for a second. We can take some more questions later if that's okay. So, so how many people ha have tattoos? Pretty decent number. So what is unique about tattoos as a biometric marker is that they're not just a physical thing that, depending on where it is on your body, you know, it can be like a fingerprint, um, but it has meaning. Uh, you might have a Pearl Jam tattoo, and that means you're somebody who likes Pearl Jam or someone who regrets liking Pearl Jam a lot earlier. <laughs> you might have something that identifies you by your religion. You might have a cross. You might have, you know, any number of tattoos that say something about you, you know, your favorite bands, your favorite uh, movies, your, you like dolphins, you know, a anything. It, it, but it does tell things about you, and it can help uh, link you to other people as well. If you have a, uh, you're a veteran and you have a tattoo of your unit, if you're a member of a labor union, you're really into your labor union, you have that kind of tattoo. Um, and the reason the police is, are really interested in this is not only because it's identifiable, because, but because there are a lot of gangs out there that identify themselves by tattoos. And they're using this idea that they need to identify connections between gangs to start developing a lot more tattoo technology. Of a lot of the ones we've talked about, this is probably one of the more nascent technologies. Um, we started looking at it uh, about maybe six, seven months ago and uh, started to get very alarmed. Um, two of the, uh, the sort of major systems out there right now, um, uh, Purdue University has a app funded by DHS that some 40 agencies in Indiana have access to in which they are uh, uh, dumping uh, uh, tattoos they capture at the point of arrest or within prison facilities and they pop that into the database. Uh, the Michigan State Police has taken its database system, handed over to Michigan State University, which then developed a tattoo recognition system and then licensed it to a company called MorphoTrack, which is one of the, uh, the biggest biometric uh, solutions for law enforcement in the country. Um, we started taking a look at the National Institute for Science and Technology. It's a research institution within the Department of Commerce, and they had been working with the FBI to uh, basically move the state of the heart state-of-the-art 
you know, make it jump up three or four steps. And what they did is they had uh, the FBI give them uh, 15,000 images captured from prisoners, which then NIST handed out to 19 private universities, private companies, private research institutions. We don't actually know who these 19 are at this point and just said, go nuts, show us what you can do. Um, and when they came out with their research paper, we started to figure out, we learned the five ways that they anticipate tattoos being used by law enforcement in the field. Um, so the first one is just tattoo detection. And this is not actually in the field. They just wanted the technology to be able to say whether an image had a tattoo. A lot of times law enforcement is collecting all kinds of images and they're just basically throwing it in a folder and it's just marked image. And so they need something that can automatically go through and sort the mug shots from the scars, from the oranges, from the tattoos. That's pretty simple. The next thing is tattoo identification. Using a tattoo to identify it to a person. If they have a, t a picture already of a tattoo of a skull that they got from you uh, when you were arrested one day, you get arrested again, they don't know who you are, they take a picture of your tattoo, run it through the system, and they, fi they find you. Um, so the idea is tattoo identification, looking at the tat same tattoo over a period of time. So that's why we have it illustrated by a young dude until you get to the bearded old dude. Another one is region of interest. They uh, have determined that there may be uh, video cam footage of, of robberies where somebody maybe has a, a, you know, a ski mask on, but you maybe see something poking out of their neck. Maybe uh, they can use that to identify somebody. They talk about using this a lot with, uh, with video and CCTV. Um, mixed media is, a, is an interesting one where they want to be able to take a picture of uh, Tweety Bird and see who has other tattoos of Tweety Bird. Um, one of the other reasons, I mean, that's one of the things they want to be able to, to also match it to graffiti. Maybe somebody has a tattoo that is very similar to a piece of graffiti in a neighborhood. Um, another reason they do this is so um, if there's an eyewitness and the eyewitness says, well, you know, he's a redheaded dude with glasses and freckles, but I remember that spider tattoo. Let me draw it out for you on a piece of paper and then matching the person that way because it can possibly be a little bit more specific than a, a sketch artist. Um, the final one is the one that worries me the most. It's called tattoo similarity. And the idea is having an image and finding everybody who has the same image or has a similar image. Um, so maybe, maybe that again, I'll just use Tweety Bird. They would bring up someone who has a picture, you know, take a picture of, a, of, of Tweety Bird and see who else has Tweety Birds. They might want to do this with gangs or hate groups. Say somebody has, uh, they want to bring up everybody in their database who has a swastika tattoo. Um, when they were doing the research, one of the things that alarmed us is they kept going back to crosses. And it was a little worrisome to me that they had come up with this system to essentially, you know, have a system where they could take a picture of somebody or automate a system to pull out everybody based on their religion or based on other things that connect them that aren't necessarily criminal in nature. Um, you know, overall, we were also generally alarmed at how they were using these data sets that they were getting. Uh, as I said, Michigan State Police handed over its stuff to Michigan State University. In Indiana, they're increasing their research by using images captured by police in the field. Uh, in Florida, the, uh, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office is handing its database over to NIST to do more research. And what's alarming to me is, is you know, Generally, with scientific research, people give consent to have their biological specimens used in, in research. In this case, they're basically turning police into specimen capturers, and you know maybe you're booked into jail on an outstanding warrant, or you you know just been too drunk in public, and then they suddenly take all these pictures of you during a strip search, and those images aren't just necessarily staying within the law enforcement; they're being handed over to you know, who, who knows, you know, all these companies who are then doing whatever with it. Um, and it was really frightening to us when we started looking through all of these presentations that all these companies were giving that you would see tattoos that would be like somebody's deceased mother with her name and, and you know, date of, date of birth and date of death. Or you would have somebody's, uh, a tattoo of somebody's child with the child's name and date of birth. And I was like, well, how can you how can you just give this over to people and let them just you know put it on screens put it on the internet um and after a lot of pressure they'd have started uh doing better with privacy uh also i mean i would like to see them do a lot more 
Um, that's what I've got on tattoo recognition for now. If anybody has any questions on that, I can field a few more. After this, I think John has a few more points, and then I have some uh, Georgia-specific uh, biometric information that I could share. Any questions? All right. Okay. Back to you, John. Oh, got oh. one over here. Oh, uh, wait for the microphone. Thank you. Um, <laughs> wow, this is a very interesting microphone. Uh, so, uh, let's say the tattoo, um, the tattoo collection matrix uh, encounters somebody who has, say, a very dark skin tone, and that person has a tattoo, but it doesn't show up because of the contrast. Or let's say somebody is very light skin tone, but it's one of those like, like white ink or like light scarring tattoos. Now, would those kind of systems? Would it be possible for, let's say, you know, somebody to have a tattoo like that, but because the contrast is uh, is so poor, or because it, it just doesn't show up that well, that it could be accidentally matched to a different person? I think in general there's a danger of matching tattoos to the wrong person because people do get similar tattoos. If you ever go into a tattoo parlor, they do have books and books of sample tattoos and sample lettering, and people do get. You know, like I've got a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy tattoo, and I think I've seen 15 of those at Dragon Con over the years. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that is an issue. But you bring up another point of, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, racial characteristics can have an issue, can cause problems for biometrics. Um, there was recently a, uh, uh, an audit of the FBI's facial recognition system, and they found that it definitely did discriminate against black people, that it just was not reading their faces with the same kind of accuracy as other people. Um, I think that with the tattoo recognition, based on the samples that we've seen, it definitely bends Latino uh, in, in nature. And that's just kind of, you know, one of the dangers with these algorithms. Well, I'd like to make two points related to your question. First is, the technology is advancing so rapidly, even if that were an issue today, in the future it's probably going to be more accurate. Uh, Dave mentioned a, a moment ago that uh, with, with facial recognition in particular, most of the data captures in the past have not been that great because typically the cameras are mounted up high, they're not getting a good head-on capture of someone's uh, face, they're getting a downward angle. That was very difficult to work with in the past, but as computer technology has gotten better, as uh, the optics on the cameras have gotten better, it's easier to get a match even if the camera is at an odd angle. Uh, now I've been reading articles recently about facial recognition with cameras that are based on drones. A couple of years ago that would have been hard to imagine because the drone wasn't perfectly still and at the angles that it would be uh, filming people it would have been nearly impossible. But uh, because the technology is moving so rapidly, it, it's hard to say where it's going to go or where it's going to end. But uh, the, the second thing is law enforcement can be very creative. There was a case, uh, I'm from Howard County, Indiana. There's a case about 20 years ago where the uh, sheriff initiated a program. He did it for over a year until one of the cases went to court and it was shot down in the courts. Uh, what he did was uh, wanting to crack down on controlled substances. He started issuing a canine partner to his patrol officers on a major highway. Whenever a car was pulled over for speeding or any type of a traffic stop, the driver would approach the uh, vehicle on one side, the canine would approach on the other side. If the dog indicated the presence of narcotics in the car, uh, marijuana in particular, that was the probable cause for doing a search. And that eventually went to court and the defense made the argument that bringing the dog up to a car that was pulled over for speeding was a search. The sheriff was arguing no, that, that uh, canine is a, an officer by law and so an officer approached and when that officer reacted that was the probable cause. Uh, the judge sided with the defense uh, in that case and said you can't do that. That is a search if you take a dog to the car. So I, I just use that as an example of uh, there are some areas out there that are not clearly defined in law because the technology is moving much, much faster than the legislature is trying to regulate it. That's, that's, that's true with all kinds of technology. Yeah. And I, I guess that's another point to, to raise is that I think that police uh, have certain policies for when they can collect uh, this kind of information uh, from people. And it's easier for them to do it once they've made an actual arrest. But sometimes police are uh, very aggressive in stopping people on the street and making them feel like they have to 
show their tattoos or make them feel like they have to pose for a picture uh, as if, you know, maybe they'll continue to be detained if they don't. And technically that ends up being consent, but then they're added into a database. Perhaps they're added into a gang database. Um, so I would definitely, if you're out and about and a police officer stops you and they don't have reason to take your picture, I wouldn't let them do it. Well, that's a perfect segue into something I wanted to bring up about uh, a appellate court ruling in Indiana just last week. In Indiana, you have to have a, a firearm permit in order to carry a firearm, but in Indiana, you do not have to carry concealed. It is legal to carry with a firearm out in the open. However, if you do that, don't be surprised if you get stopped and a police officer asks to see your carry permit. Well, that uh, recently went to an Indiana appellate court. Um, what happened in this particular case, a taxi driver called 911 after somebody he had given a ride to was getting out of the taxi. A firearm fell out on the floor. The guy picked it up, put it back into its uh, holster, and then went into a movie theater. Taxi driver called 911 to report man with a gun. So officers respond, they go into the movie theater, they find someone that matches the description that the taxi driver gave them. They ask the man if he had a firearm and he said no. Then they notice the bulge under his shirt. They arrested him. Uh, he was uh, initially convicted. It went to an appellate court. The appellate court struck it down, overturned it. Uh, th and this is what the, the appellate court ruled. There are two different standards legally. There's reasonable suspicion and there's probable cause. Reasonable suspicion is a lower legal standard. And under, under the way things had been done, if the police see someone carrying a firearm, uh, they are allowed to stop someone if they have reasonable suspicion. It's sometimes called a Terry stop based on Terry versus Ohio, uh, US Supreme Court ruling several years ago. But if the police have reasonable suspicion, the person is either in process of committing a crime or about to commit a crime, they can stop that person and, and talk to them. What was happening in Indiana up until this appellate court ruling if the police officer saw someone with a firearm, they could be committing a crime if they are carrying that without a, a permit. And so they would stop the person and ask to see the permit. When it went to the uh, appellate court, the appe appellate court said the fact that you're carrying a firearm is not reasonable suspicion to stop someone um, because you're assuming they do not have a permit rather than uh, assuming that they do have a permit. So anyway, just last week, the appellate court struck that down and said, just the fact that I can see someone has a firearm is not a reasonable suspicion to stop them and uh, search them or ask them questions, detain them in any manner. So uh, no, uh, no word yet whether that's gonna be appealed to uh, the Supreme Court or not, but an appellate court uh, gave a ruling that uh, I thought was pretty interesting for, for Indiana. Was, this, was that a state uh, appellate court? State appellate court. Oh, let's, let's see, see a question back that? here. Yeah, this one's been waiting. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> um, hey, uh, you guys mentioned earlier that police can uh, convince to you to let your picture be taken by them and that would constitute consent. Um, but it got me thinking, like, how long has this tap or how long has this facial recognition, tattoo recognition uh, software been in use by police departments? Um, about how prevalent is it? And um, what are some of the methods that are used to take uh, visual records? So I would say that even before there was the technology, I mean, with tattoos and faces, I mean, they would have binders, you know, uh, that they would use to collect. And so they would do the same methods, but just to collect stuff that they could have it and they could do a human, you know, biometric identification, so to speak. Um, but I would say it's about 10 years, maybe a little bit 10 more since we start to see this take off. There's no real good way to know on how prevalent this is. Um, last year, uh, we teamed up with a organization called Muckrock that uh, files lots of public records requests across the country and we ended up filing some 200 records requests uh, you know based on tips from people and 
you know, of those, I think that maybe thir between 30 and 50 actually bothered to, well, sorry, of those, about 100 of the 200 actually bothered to respond to our records request. The rest just kind of ignored us. Um, of the 100 who did respond, I think about 70 said they didn't, a 30 that said they did. I don't, still don't like that number because, for example, with Albuquerque Police Department, they were like, no, we don't have any biometric technology. And I Googled Albuquerque and facial recognition. <laughs> and then I was like, wait, 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 what about this? And they're like, oh, well, you know, that was a pilot program that ended a month ago. You know, we haven't yet reinstated it. Um, so, I mean, it's there's no there's no way good to know. But in, when I move over to Georgia, I can give some some very specific data about who in Georgia has some of this technology. Okay, sure. Okay, so so some of this is anecdotal. Um, all right, so so things that we do know is that there's a lot of scraping of uh, social media going on uh, to begin with. So that's one thing right there. Um, as far as during stops, everything that I have is just sort of anecdotal, things that bubble up. People don't necessarily, when things happen to them, they don't necessarily know it's wrong what happened to them, or if they do know it was wrong and it happened to them by police, they don't know who to tell about it. They don't necessarily trust a, a reporter. If they do call the reporter, the reporter may not understand why it was bad either. Um, so we only hear things occasionally. Um, since the tattoo recognition stuff started and there's been other things that have come up with particularly DNA and the facial recognition, in San Diego I can I have some pretty good examples where there will be a guy who will you know get stopped by police and they're like, can we take your picture? And they've already held him there for like 15 minutes and he's like, I'm not saying yes, but I guess I'm not saying no either. And that was enough for them to do it. Um, but. You know, one of the other things, especially with, with gangs, within gang culture, uh, typically it's been you have to be proud about your gang. And so if somebody asks you to show your gang tattoo, you show your gang tattoo. And gangs haven't necessarily been shy about telling police who they are. And that has also resulted in them catching uh, a lot of that kind of data. I'm talking fast, so we're good on time. <laughs> You got three questions in your thing, did you? Well, one of them was him repeating a question. All right, ready? <laughs> Good <try. laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, this is my last question, by the way, so I'm sorry if I've been going over. Um, is it, you, what you had said was that they, you don't have to explicitly give permission to have your photo taken. I'm wondering, does the, uh, does the law, the law enforcement party, have to explicitly uh, reveal that they are law enforcement at the time of the photo? That is something I do not know the answer Anecdotal, to. Anecdotal, I know. Uh, so. Yeah, but we do know that that law enforcement have been working with uh, large events, you know, where they might use the cameras at a at a concert or a stadium event and test out facial recognition on the crowd that way. But one thing I just want to throw in, one of the fastest growing uh, technologies in use with law enforcement right now is body-worn cameras. And th there are multiple reasons for this. Like I said, technology is not good or bad. It's, it's all what you do with it. Uh, a friend of mine is a, a police chief for one city in Indiana. They were part of a grant where they got a bunch of free body cameras for his entire department. Uh, he actually wrote a paper on this. One of the things he had to do as police chief was write a manual or write the uh, protocol about how these cameras are to be used. Very first question, I as an officer who is now wearing a camera attached to my tie recording everything that I'm doing, do I have permission to turn this camera off while I'm on duty? A and think about that for just a moment before you answer to yourself, are there times that I want that officer to turn this camera off or should it be policy, this is on the entire time that I'm on duty? And think carefully because if the answer is I can turn this off then I pull Dave over he gets a little mouthy with me click I can say or do anything that I want I turn it back on and I can record him resisting arrest and so there, there's an argument that says no that camera needs to be on the entire time I'm on duty okay if that's the policy Dave calls 911 because his wife slipped in the shower banged her head 
I'm the first responder and I go running into Dave's house because his wife is bleeding. Um, can I turn this camera off or do I have to record everything that goes on in the bathroom? And then that video, uh, is that available to the public or do the police get to determine when it's made available? And the, the whole point is there are man years of video being captured right now. There is no consistent policy nationwide on how this video is treated. It's a department by department policy. Some are, are saying we're going to keep it for 30 days, then purge it. Others are saying we're going to keep it forever. Some allow officers to turn it off, some don't. But there is absolutely nothing to stop a police department from saying, well, you know, I've got eight hours of footage from everything that Dave saw when he was on duty last night. Let's just run this through facial recognition and record everything. Or have install facial recognition automatically into yes. it. Um, well, you know, one of the, the other things that I should have mentioned earlier is so I work on a lot of things. I, I, a lot of my work involves license plate readers and how uh, this technology, the uh, police department will put cameras all over town and put cameras on cars and they recognize license plates of every car that passes. And then as they collect that data in aggregate, they can track where you've been. Um, my worry is that we'll get to a point in the fairly short term where facial recognition can operate in the same fashion that if you have a network of cameras around a city and they're all programmed to recognize faces that then they can track you where you're going uh, with you know as your face as your unique identifier uh, I see a question in the back back there oh yeah then, I'll, then, I'll, then, I'll, then there's I'll, one against the, uh, the wall after this well okay as it is we got this gentleman the one up in the front this gentleman and this one. we'll let you we'll let I'll you keep track <laughs> As you, you have a question, let me know. Raise your hand. I can tag you, put you into the queue. Make sense? Hi. I, um, I spent some time uh, some number of years ago overseas collecting biometric data uh, with an agency I won't name. Um, <laughs> the question that I have for you guys is an American police procedure is retinal identification still a boogeyman or is it a thing that we need to start really being worried about and and, and if, if retinal being iris the same yeah. sort of thing no but i mean for the purposes of the question though is not are they the same thing but a I, camera I identifying you from a distance and taking a picture of your retina that can then be used to identify oh, from, you. from a distance yeah so i haven't heard about that in the field i do know that lapd and a few other agencies are starting to integrate uh, Irish recognition into their software, uh, but I, I can't say anything about Retina at this point. That, that hasn't come across my transom. I, I, I am not aware of Retina uh, scans that can be done from a distance. The only ones that I'm familiar with require very close uh, distances, so if that technology exists, I'm just not familiar with it. Well, I know we're talking all about states and everything. Um, what about um, biometrics for, you know, on the federal level? Um, I know that before I was deployed in 2010, um, we had, you know, we were exposed to biometric equipment to um, recognize terrorists, um, and and you know, in the in the Middle East. So I'm wondering about, you know, that kind of thing. And also, um, uh, facial recognition and everything could put you on a terror list and, you know, privacy and, you know, mistaken identity and stuff like that. Yeah. So the FBI has something called the NGI database, which they're amassing, that has billions and billions of records in there. Um, and they're actually not only using records that they've collected in a criminal justice capacity, but all these records that he was talking about, that John was talking about earlier, that they've captured through, you know, general civil service, you know, as a government employee. And it gives them the ability to, uh, when they do have a suspect, to run it through both databases looking at you. It, the only one that I'm familiar with that's uh, routinely used, and as Dave mentioned, this other one is still in development. I don't know the full extent of how it's being used today, but there's what's called AFIS, uh, AFIS, and that's what uh, all states submit fingerprints to so that if a person is, uh, a warrant is put out for someone in Georgia, but that person is pulled over for speeding in another state, uh, they could match up fingerprints. Well, the AFIS uh, works with NCI, NC, 
NCIC or I, yeah, NCIC, yeah. National Criminal Instant Check. Um, th there are standards for taking fingerprints so that uh, when all states contribute fingerprint data to the database, it's matched. But uh, APHIS is a, a part that works with that. Okay. Great. This is kind of off the subject, but um, did anybody, I came in a little late, did you guys talk about gate analysis and anything? No, no, we didn't talk about gate analysis, but, but that's another one, you know, as well. The ability for a camera to start identifying people by the way you walk. This is a technology that, that I know, you know, an EFF, you know, one of my coworkers, Corey Doctorow, has put that in his science fiction before, and it's definitely something out there. I haven't necessarily seen it deployed, um, very specifically yet because capturing that kind of data uh, at an individual level is not it's still quite difficult where I've seen that come up is uh, transportation agencies want to know how many pedestrians are crossing a certain area and so they would have something that can generally identify some that somebody is walking but I haven't seen anybody with very good specific analysis yet now that's not saying that there's some intelligence agencies that have you know, technologies that I'm not aware of that have been redacted from the records I've received, but I definitely think this is something on the horizon. Yeah, because um, the reason I brought it up, because I noticed in New York, they're, uh, they got a network of uh, cameras that they're putting up, um, you know, you combine that with uh, facial recognition, gate, you know, gate recognition, and uh, a few other things, it's almost, uh, you know, it's, you know, I'm just a little paranoid person. <laughs> no, it's certainly if they get if if they're recording all this stuff and they're storing in mass, there's nothing to keep them from like developing a technology later and then applying yeah. it to all the stuff that they already have sitting on hard drives. Right. Um, maybe one more, and then I want to jump to the Georgia okay. stuff. Yeah, if that's okay. I know this will be a complete guesstimate on your part with the current concerns with stingrays. How many years? Do you believe that this technology biometrics will be able to cross-reference with stingrays? <sighs> Particularly with someone that has a good cause that may be uh, surveillance in a certain area for a uh, political dissent. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm. Uh, I'm not sure it would be necessary that much to mix the two because you know once you have a lock on someone's cell phone, you get pretty good specifics on on where they're moving. Um, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, I could see, you know, he had mentioned drones having having facial recognition on them. And, you know, the, the company that provides it into San, Die into San Diego system for facial recognition is called Airborne Biometrics. Um, they don't have airborne biometrics, but clearly that's their intent. And it's not hard to see. I mean, you know that they have that law enforcement will have vans that have everything in them. Every possible surveillance technology you could want in a van would be in there. And so it's not hard to think that that may be a connection along those ways. But maybe, John, you have a different thought. I, I can't speak with any first-hand knowledge on the Stingrays. I know that um, the company that makes those, uh, their cell tower simulators, your cell phone will connect with this device and then it can track your movements. Uh, the law enforcement agencies that use those sign non-disclosure agreements and some of them are using that as a shield to try and avoid freedom of information request. Uh, that is something that's working its way through the courts because personally I think that is an abuse of, uh, of NDAs trying to uh, shield things that the public has a right to know. Uh, so I, I can't speak to any details on that because I just don't know. Uh, let me ask one question. How many of you read anything about the, for lack of a better term, spy plane that was over Baltimore for a couple of weeks? Okay, about, about a third of you. Uh, private company, they put up a, a plane that's basically circled around Baltimore for several weeks. Uh, very high res, not just one camera, I think there were 10 cameras, but uh, they were constantly taking photographs around Baltimore with very high resolution cameras. With software, they were stitching the images from multiple high resolution cameras together. The way that uh, the owner of the company described it, he said, imagine Google Earth and TiVo combined. And so this plane that's capturing these images, now people are so tiny on this being taken from a plane, but you're capturing the whole city. And the police used it to solve a couple of crimes. There was somebody that was killed and police were able to watch a car leave the scene where somebody was killed. You couldn't read a license plate or anything, but they could follow the movement of the car until it went to a warehouse several miles away. And then they 
sent police into where that warehouse was. But the whole point is the entire city was being photographed in high resolution and that was being done without anyone's knowledge that it was going on. It went on for several weeks. Um, but that just made the paper here just in the last couple of weeks. So, so jumping on to just some specific stuff, and we can take some more questions in a moment. It won't take me long to get through this. But um, uh, so as I mentioned before, we filed public records requests across the country. One of the places that was recommended to us was Bibb County here in Georgia. Anyone here from Bibb County? No. Interestingly, though, Bibb County handed us over some data about the entire state. Um, <laughs> oops. So uh, in Georgia, this is called Rapid ID, and that's what it's called a lot of other places. I've got data here, uh, two, kind of two different sets of, well, maybe several different sets of data. Um, so, you know, this first one will tell you, you know, how many times that they, you know, uh, sorry, that's kind of annoying. Um, yeah, I, it's because it's plugged in, it's having issues. Um, uh, because it's plugged into the the screen, I can't I can't expand. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so so I've I, we're still trying to figure out what these numbers mean because they didn't give us a data dictionary to go with it. Because there is the rapid agency hit uh, rapid ID agency hits, which I believe this is against their mugshot database or their their internal the agency's uh, fingerprint database. But I'll just sort of scroll down. You can see. The, the left column is whether they got a hit on when they did a scan, whether they didn't get a hit. And you can see that, you know, the Atlanta Detention Center is doing lots of scans because it's where people are getting booked. And then you look on and then suddenly uh, Chatham County uh, Sheriff's Office is doing it a lot. Um, and then you kind of move down and, uh, you know, these are, uh, this is when, they're, when they actually do a scan and it hits NCIC, which we talked about before. Um, then here is a list of uh, all of the devices that each of them have. And um, yeah, the di different companies, Blue Check is a really um, common one. I believe I actually have the, uh, no, that's DataWorks. DataWorks is also a really popular one. And here's actually the brochure for, hey, buy this. And this is what it will, uh, if your agency buys this in Georgia, this is what you'll, what you'll get out of it. And that's kind of what it looks like. And that's kind of what it'll show you. Um, and then there's another database called the Reposit Repository for uh, Individuals of Special Concern. And you can see they also got uh, some good data on that. Um, I'm going to just go to put this URL up there that you can see that if you wanted to look at that document yourself, you know, there it is. Um, but, uh, you know, we didn't, you know, we we'd put in a public records request at the Atlanta PD. They told us that they had these fingerprint scanners. They didn't tell us they had anything else. Um, same with Bibb County. Uh, we haven't put in public records requests with anybody else at the moment, but uh, it's certainly something we could do if you thought that there was a reason we should uh, PR, uh, put in public records request in a certain agency. So that's what I had on that. If we can go back to questions now. So we have number one, girl in the shirt shoots number two, gentleman over here in the red shirt number three. Okay. Okay, so I just recently read something. Apparently, um, Nougat, I don't know how much you're familiar with like the Android operating systems, but they were suggesting that like Nougat, which is the upgrade from Marshmallow, I think it is, um, is supposed to have retinal identification in the phones. And knowing that, and knowing the amount of data that is supposedly skimmed from the um, cell phone industry I'm curious like how much access they're gonna have I mean because like you can already put in your fingerprint how much access they're actually gonna have from the cell phones that they may actually skim and take to you know for retinal scans do you know I mean like possibilities something they're already planning <laughs> I mean if it's in there and they already know it's coming out then you can guarantee they've already got something on the heads up for it yeah I, I don't have any specific knowledge about this I think I think we, we frame the panel as as uh, biometrics and law enforcement because that's one can of worms and then once you get into the commercial can like side of things it's an even bigger can of worms um, we were actually part of a of a uh, you know a, a federal 
you know, uh, it was not, I don't think it was a federal group, but it was a, a national group of organizations discussing facial recognition. We ended up walking out of it along with all other civil liberties and privacy groups because a lot of these uh, commercial companies were just not concerned with privacy at all and they weren't going to even compromise on anything. We were just like, screw it, and left. Um, I wish I had better answers for you on the, uh, the retinal stuff, but we do hear about that sort of stuff on the horizon. I just can't be, speak with any authority. I mean, it's just the fact that they... If, if they've already sent in like warrants for breaking people's phones, yeah. it's the thing that the information off of it. I mean, and everything is in the cloud and everything's connected. Now it doesn't matter where you go. The law enforcement easily pull anything they need to off of anybody's phone anyway. Who has this? So you mean like pulling, so law enforcement pulling information off yeah. of your, because your phone is collecting biometrics? Yeah, you were in this area during a certain period of time, and guess what? Now they have, they said, well, these 20 people were in this particular area that we thought a crime was taking place, place, and now they suddenly want to collect all that data you know, from those homes. You know, th that's that's definitely something that concerns me. Uh, this is not an answer to your question, but another thing that concerns me as well is, uh, you know, virtual reality is going to be taking off very soon in people's homes. There's, you know, PlayStation's about to ship out all of its PlayStation VR stuff. And there's a lot of biometrics that are going to be collected by these devices based on your arm movement, If depending on what kind of device you have. If you have, like, the HTC Vive, you're going to be moving around to space. And in order for those to function, they need to capture your body movement. And, you know, my worry is, is that at what point are they going to be able to recognize you by the way you move your head or the way that you react to a punch thrown at you in a boxing game? And will that stuff be requestable by police when, you know, police are investigating you? I mean, take the next question, I guess. Thank you. Hi, my name is, oh God, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Madeline. I'd like to address a question about gate biomechanics that was brought up earlier and that wasn't really um, answered. So I'm a PhD student studying um, stem cell, like the still cell research. And one way we try to validate treatments is through gate analysis. And one thing the science community has found is that gate mechanics are not a good way to validate anything because they can change on a day to day to week to week to month to month basis. Like, yes, you can see if someone has a limp, but even that could, the way the limp like just moves through, like how you move through space will change, like how you compensate. So like while that is horrible, like that they're gating, that they're like, what? Yeah, like just the shoes you're wearing, if you're barefoot or not. So while it is like, it's really uncomfortable that they're ca collecting this data on you, it's not really helpful. In well, that's really if I could uh, yeah. point out one thing, as we're talking about biometrics, biometrics are used in two broad categories, one for identification and one for verification. Identification is sometimes called one to many, meaning I have a fingerprint, I don't know who it belongs to, and I'm going to compare it against a million fingerprints to see if I can find a match. That's biometric identification. That is much more difficult to do. What I think the gate analysis is going to be more commonly used for is verification. If, if I have a security pass to get me into a certain building or a controlled room, there could be cameras, there could be microphones that listen to the way I walk. And the way I walk is not so distinct from the way everyone else walks that I could be picked out of a million people, but I could easily be flagged as that's not John Padfield. Uh, this person's walking too fast or something's going on. I don't think that's him. And, and so the, the verification just says, are you who you claim to be? And if that's used in conjunction with a pen or used in conjunction with a facial recognition or something, the computer could be smart enough to say, well, the face matches, but the walk doesn't. Maybe we need to have a security guard take a look at him before he goes into that controlled room. But I, I really think that the gate analysis is probably more for verification than identification. The, the one thing I've not really heard in this conversation, and, and it came up especially with ALPR um, when it got real big here in Georgia, uh, was, is the offloading of data to private companies. Um, ACLU of Georgia went hardcore after uh, Department of Public Safety and a bunch of other people. And when they were their, their first challenge back was, well, we're not collecting the data. Some other company that runs a different database is doing it. And then they would quietly go off and let that company mine the data for whatever they wanted, um, thus sh shooting massive holes in chains of evidence and all that kind of stuff. So uh, if they are offloading the data, I mean, how do you protect against you know, the gathering of unwarranted data or the um, unwarranted tracking of that data. I mean, it's interesting bringing that. I mean, it's Taser is now becoming a body camera 
company, uh, but they're not just becoming a body camera company, they're becoming a video storage company, and that is going to be one of their big things that they do. Um, you know, it's actually like a, a mixed bag, you know, th th there's arguments one way and another. So the, the argument for using a private service for that is that, you know, a lot of these small town uh, police departments and county sheriffs, they don't have sophisticated IT people and cybersecurity professionals, and they might just buy a license plate reader camera, a biometric device, and hook it up and put no security measures whatsoever on it, which we've actually seen. And you know, we had done a report where three police departments in the uh, uh, New Orleans area, their license plate reader cameras could be—you could open them on a web browser and look right through them, and you could siphon off their their data, because they're not. That's not what they do. That's not what they do for a living. Uh, so on one hand, there's an argument that, okay, if there is a company that this is what they specialize in, they have trained people, then maybe it's a good thing. But the trade-off there is what are they doing with the data? Who does it belong to? Is it just, you know, suddenly like a, a shadow private police force? And I do think that's, that's kind of how a lot of these have to operate. Um, and that's something that when your local you know, city council or county is considering this, you should bring that up during during public comment. You should ask your city councilors, like, don't just take the police word about how useful this would be. Ask what the accountability measures are. Who does the data belong to? If you cancel the contract, does the company get to keep it or do they have to wipe their servers? I'd like to add to that. I mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of the session tonight that I served two terms in the Indiana House of Representatives. There are a lot of people that serve in government at all levels, from city council up to up through Congress. They got involved for one reason or another, and these privacy issues were probably not even on their radar. They, they got involved because of a tax issue or because of an inheritance issue or whatever. There was probably some other issue that drew them into running for office in the first place. When I, when I think about some of the county sheriffs that I know, the ones that I know are good people. But these type of issues about when I'm signing a contract with a company, what provisions need to be in here, that's not the type of thing that they're thinking about. What they're thinking about is, I have a fixed budget. My job is to get criminals off the street. Will this technology help me? And some of them don't have good technology people to help them make those decisions. What they're doing is they're listening to the hype from the companies that are coming in saying, boy, I can solve all of your problems. Give me a check for $200,000 and we'll clean up your, your county. And they will use a couple of high profile success stories. And I will not deny for a second, there are some success stories out there where a terrible crime was committed and a matter of 45 minutes later through a license plate reader, the bad guy was caught. That happens. But the flip side of that coin is there's a whole lot of people, millions and millions of innocent people whose movements have been tracked inadvertently and that data is sitting out there and nobody knows what's going to be done with that data in the future. There could be things done with that data in the future that aren't even possible today. And that's the part that very few people are thinking about because the salesmen trying to sell county sheriffs and uh, city police chiefs on this technology these are not the type of issues they bring up and so each of you as an individual that's your job to make sure that these type of things come up in those discussions you've got to make your voices heard privacy matters to you it matters in the voting booth you have to send that message because the people who are running for office this is not the type of things that they're using to make their decisions on yep uh do we have time for like one last one i think maybe uh, i think we have time for one last one i'll make it quick um so uh, you guys were talking about uh, how the police, you know, like you guys, sorry, uh, the police have the technology to, you know, collect all this information and you showed like the brochure where the companies are selling it to them. Is there any like regulation on how could I as like a private business owner or a private citizen even like get one of those programs and start, you know, entering my friends into the system or something? Like is there, because we've talked about the... Uh, laws on the side of what happens to the data, but is there laws on who can collect that data? Oh, that's a, a big question because right. it can vary from state to state, and I'm, I, I don't have a I don't have a really good answer for you because it would have to involve looking very closely at what the rules are, um, you know, in a given place. Um, you know, I think that I think that Chicago probably just passed. I heard Chicago passed a pretty good biometrics rule that may have covered some of that, but I I. 
I only have so much in my head at the moment, especially on a Saturday night. Well, I, I would just add to that, as Dave said, those those laws are going to vary state by state. The interpretation of those laws are going to vary court by court. I, I gave you an example of, of what happened in Indiana just last week. If I'm an officer and I see someone walk by and I can see that they have a firearm, is that reasonable suspicion? For years, that was accepted as reasonable suspicion. Uh, as of last week, an appellate court said, no, that is not reasonable suspicion. So it's not just the laws varying, but the interpretation of the laws are going to vary court by court. With that, we're out of time. I appreciate everyone being here tonight and hope you enjoy the rest of the con. Yeah, there's so many of you here at 830. I'm really, really happy.